I grew up on a farm, and my, my dad hunted, and I always was a, was a tag-along. And the sweetest sound to me was to hear the Bob White call, and it's, I think it's so sad now that, that so many children, or even adults, never have the privilege of, of just the heart-stopping sound of the, of the Bob White. But it, it's just something about, about hearing that, that you just have to stop whatever you're doing and listen. For hundreds of years, the call of the Bob White was one of the most common heralds of spring in rural Virginia. But all that has changed. No longer are the places we find quail, batches of brambles, overgrown thickets, grasses, and wildflowers, biologists call early successional habitat, woven into the very fabric of our landscape. Over the years, land use and farming practices have gradually become transformed. Modern, clean farming techniques discourage weedy borders and overgrown fallow fields. Fescue pastures have replaced prime quail habitat. Urban and suburban landscapes have replaced fence posts and field borders with houses and strip malls. Bob White quail populations have now been reduced to isolated pockets. The decline of quail populations and their habitat is a serious cause for alarm and a call to action. Mark Puckett, a biologist heading up Virginia's quail plan, insists recovery is possible. I've been studying quail now for 18 years. I started reading the literature on quail in 1992, so I've been involved in it for some time. Uh, back in 1992, folks were predicting that by now, quail may be extirpated in much of their range based on the rate of decline. So uh, folks will say, why haven't you done more for quail or, or are we losing the battle? And I would argue that we have uh, been able to achieve success in quail management. But an, an agency alone cannot bring back a species. Biologists have realized the key to success of any plan for quail recovery depends on private landowners working together to weave quail habitat back into our landscape like a quilt, piece by piece, acre by acre, farm by farm. I believe if you build it, if you, if you build a habitat, they'll come. Hudson Reese is a farmer and sportsman in Southside, Virginia. He remembers the glory days of quail. And back in the 50s and 60s, uh, it wasn't unusual to find six to eight coveys of quail in a, a day's hunt or even in a half day's hunt. And it, wasn't, it wasn't unusual to kill a limit of eight quail in a day's hunt. But today, with quail numbers on a downward spiral, down 80% since 1966, and with quail hunters becoming a vanishing breed, down 90 percent, Reese believes now is the time to take action. I think too many hunters have given up instead of giving back. And there's a lot, a lot of quail hunters, that I guess we could say, used to be quail hunters, former quail hunters, that have just given up. Eric Brittle. A Southside Virginia farmer and sportsman is giving back. Well, uh, I grew up here on, this is my family farm here in Southampton and part of it's in Surrey counties. And um, my dad was an avid quail hunter back in the 70s and early 80s. And um, that's all I remember doing during hunting season is, is walking through these woods and around the field edges with him hunting quail. On this farm, we have 110 open acres that's farmed. And I've taken 27 of those acres, which comes out to 120 foot border all the way around the farm in each of these fields and planted it in the CP33 program through NRCS. That includes warm season grasses and some forbs and doing a little bit of um, management for, for native vegetation. The numbers of quail have increased. Um, I s tend to flush a few more coveys um, around the field edges and um, even this year I saw evidence of a, a second brood late in the year with small chicks in uh, August. Even though Eric has taken his farm borders out of production, it hasn't cost him anything and he's found less deer damage. 
Overall, the, uh, the income from the farming and the uh, CP33 program has kept the income from year to year pretty much the same. Haven't, haven't cost uh, us any money as far as income from the farming operation. If anything, there's probably one, one benefit that I'm kind of starting to see. Deer browsing on the, the soybeans and in the corn, I believe that's minimized. You're taking land that's on the edges of the fields that's not necessarily your best most productive land in the field, putting this into this program, and as the deer bed in these areas or use these as travel corridors, they're browsing in these CP33 or the CREP areas and not in the fields. At a farm just down the road, wildlife enthusiast Phil Bain has seen similar results from five years of managing for quail on his land. I, I've seen mostly the birds rebound. I've seen uh, quite, a, quite a bit more quail. Um, seeing that and, and the turkeys have, have come back. Uh, I think that with understory burning have really benefited the, uh, the turkey population. Um, but the ground nesting birds seem to be the main species that have benefited. So Phil, one thing we're trying to promote here with this whole quail plan is, is not just to promote quail, but to package it as kind of a habitat plan for your early successional uh, songbirds and your pollinators and bees. Um, and could you tell me a little bit about what you came in here and what you planted initially? Well, we came in five years ago and put these hardwood trees in, uh, in these rows in the uh, CREP program, mm -hmm. CP21. When, once we had established the hardwood, we came in and planted the uh, Lespedeza in between the rows of trees. Okay. Uh, everything else has been natural. So a lot of it just came up through the seed bed. Okay. Because when we're looking around, you see a lot of ragweed, which is good and beneficial for quail and uh, big blue stem grass. Um, one thing I like to talk about is how uh, fescue fields don't really do a lot of good for, for uh, ground nesting birds. And if you think about little chicks trying to wander through the undergrowth, they really can't readily make it through that. So what we'd like to promote is the warm season grasses that don't grow as dense on the, on the ground level, um, but it also provides good foraging from, from insects and uh, it's a rich source of protein in the spring and the summer when the chicks are trying to grow and, and put on mass. The reasons that we've done it, and I think the primary benefits of it are, are twofold. A, we're providing wildlife habitat. It benefits the deer, the quail, the turkeys, the, all wildlife. Secondly are the financial benefit. We've, uh, we're getting as much or more rent or per acre than we were getting from the farmer producing row crops. And so we feel like we hadn't given anything up and we're, we're getting a real benefit financially and uh, with the wildlife. Now the benefits to the landowner can be numerous. Uh, even though these uh, practices may be called quail management practices, they benefit dozens of wildlife species, uh, including numerous pollinating insects. Uh, this is something that we've really uh, started to see across the landscape as a decline in pollinating insects. And I think, you know, if you're a farmer, you obviously know the benefits of pollinating insects. Okay, what we'll do is uh, we'll smoke the bees uh, and get calm them down. As, as a beekeeper, it's great to plant things that are good for my bees, a great nectar source, but also good for quail because quail love uh, yellow clover, they love crimson clover, they love buckwheat. People planting quail habitat help the bees and uh, also help the quail. So it's a benefit to both the beekeeper and the people that want to see the quail come back. Quail restoration in Virginia depends on people working together. And 22 conservation agencies have pledged to help landowners with monetary support, with technical know-how, and with boots on the ground. The timing couldn't be better uh, with continued declines, unfortunately, in bobwhite quail. It's really nice that uh, we've gotten a program going now with our uh, quail action plan and the bobwhite quail initiative to provide some funding, first off, to uh, uh, try to restore quail habitat and quail populations and, and try to reverse the trend that we've seen over the last uh, good while, uh, try to educate some folks about quail habitat and quail management. and provide some demonstration areas so people can go out and, and see what quail habitat looks like. In turn, then those focal areas can serve as additional demonstration sites for other folks, other landowners, and others who are interested in bobwhite quail management. 
Well, when you talk about conservation practices in general, oftentimes there'll be folks that are willing to do that. Uh, but sometimes you're going to meet people that are on the fence. It could be for economic reasons, various reasons, family concerns. And what we do as conservationists with the Natural Resources Conservation Service is not only we give them world-class technical assistance, but we also educate farmers and landowners on the benefits, not only of wildlife management, but stewardship in general. With the Farm Service Agency, we offer the Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP for short. And in that program, we offer a specific practice that targets quail and songbirds, other related species. Um, that program is offered specifically on cropland, so it's directed towards production agriculture and farmers involved in um, row crops. It's going to create uh, early successional habitat that benefits quail, songbirds, and, uh, as, as well as pollinators. We can bring quail back to Virginia. We can restore a precious piece of our southern heritage by changing the landscape we live in. But only if landowners answer the call of the Bob White. I got enough pleasure out of quail in the, in my, I've had enough pleasure out of quail in my lifetime to feel some responsibility to give back to, so that my grandchildren or great grandchildren could enjoy that heritage or have. Many folks have said that we're at a time where this is the last call for species like Bob White Quail and many others. And in some ways that's true. Uh, they cannot continue to, to decline forever without something being done to help those declines be reversed. So as a landowner, this is an opportune time in your life to be a part of species recovery. There's no time like the present. These species need your help now. Uh, they don't need your help 25 years from now. Now is the time to do it.